Hello and welcome to episode 143 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. I'm Jay Whittingham. This week, fusion breakthrough. All clean energy needs have been met. This podcast is no longer necessary. Go listen to Joe Rogan. Oh, wait, I'm hearing in my ear that people are overreacting to this news and commercialization is still decades away. In the meantime, we have to mitigate climate change ASAP. The world's first utility-scale solar project is going ahead with solar panels sitting flat on the ground. These green energy hippies were just too lazy to put them up on a proper map. The Salton Sea in California apparently has more lithium than the... The Salton Sea in California apparently has more lithium than Nevada's Lake Mead has dead bodies. Some think there's enough lithium to power the entire United States and then some. Huge congratulations to TC Energy's Keystone Pipeline that has successfully leaked more oil than any other pipeline since 2010. Wait, I'm being told that's a bad thing. As well, we have stories on Canada cancelling fossil fuel subsidies. Well, sort of. Uh, an update on people shooting at power stations. Sales for cargo ships. People who hate wind turbines and more are more likely to think that the moon landing was fake. Plus, a new study on traditional nuclear helping or not helping the fight against global warming. And much more on this week's edition of The Clean Energy Show. Yeah, so first up for me is an update. As you know, I'm trying to get rid of fossil fuels in my own house because I love the planet and I don't want to burn any more fossil fuels than I have to. Good for you, so, Brian. Um, made a little bit of progress, been speaking to a contractor who could put in an Arctic type, um, you know, air source heat pump so I can get rid of my natural gas furnace. And uh, the latest update is that it's uh, 16 weeks from when you order it because, you know, there's a backlog. Four and, months. Uh, and they want you to pay up front. <laughs> oh. Hey, you pay up front. <laughs> Gesundheit, you got to pay up front. And uh, yeah, 16 weeks then. So the point being this week, because we've talked about these kinds of, um, you know, subsidies like a, for 100% pumps, up front, 100%, right? You got to pay 100% up front to get this. And why is that? And then wait 16 weeks. Because there's just huge demand for them, which is oh. basically what's going on all over the world. Like there's a couple of stories here. I've got one from Clean Technica. Uh, the title is uh, heat pumps are, uh, heat pumps are on fire globally. They mean as in getting more popular. Um, you know, it's uh, heat pump sales rose 15% in 2021 and they're expecting for something similar or greater uh, this coming year. Europe, they rose by 35% in 2021. And of course, uh, they're very much trying to get off of Russian gas in Europe, and uh, heat pumps is, uh, you know, definitely one of the ways to do it. Um, and there's another story here from China. China is actually the world leader on heat pump adoption. Of course, mm -hmm. they have a very large population, and uh, you know they do things big in China when they when they do them. So, um, thirty-five percent. Um, oh, sorry, forty-five percent. Uh, sales are up 35% in Europe and 45% in China for heat pumps. So I bring this all up because we were talking in the last couple of weeks about subsidies that are available for things like heat pumps. So um, I'm in the Green Home, Greener Homes grant in Canada, so I should get about $5,000 to help offset this cost. Yeah. And in the U.S. is the Inflation Reduction Act. And starting in January, there's going to be subsidies for people to do things like put in heat pumps and other kind of uh, energy upgrades. But I wanted to tell our listeners because there is going to be a global shortage of heat pumps. So if it's something you're thinking of doing, uh, you know, start talking to somebody now and maybe beat the rush because there's definitely going to be a rush in January in the U.S. Uh, when Can uh, a person invest in a heat pump company? I mean, is there anybody who's on the, the stock market that, that would make a good investment? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but um, I'm going to make a note of that and check later because, yeah, that, that's uh, that's probably a smart idea. Well, get back to us. Uh, I'd yeah. be curious to know. And it's certainly anyone who makes a cost-effective, the most cost-effective heat pump and maybe the most efficient heat pump, yeah, uh, they're going to win the game. 
um, yeah. especially if they patent that technology. So, I mean, keep an eye on developments there because they sure, are. Sure. Yeah. No, there's two, two things like the cost of the unit and then the efficiency of the unit. I mean, generally speaking, you're going to kind of be paying more upfront, which is the common refrain here on the clean energy show. You're probably going to be paying more upfront for the equipment but uh, it will be hopefully cheaper in the long run. It's a bit of a weird equation where we live because in this ridiculous frigid place and our natural gas prices are still quite good. Our natural gas is still fairly cheap here. So yeah. I'm not necessarily going to be saving money um, right away by doing this. Um, it's more of a long-term gambit. And, you know, I just, just want to get the gas out of my house. Yeah. You know, I was going to say paying for it up front, you'd run the risk of them going out of business. But <laughs> then, you know, possible, they're not going to yeah. go into business, are they? <laughs> the chances are... I don't are, think so, because... They'd yeah, have to be doing because, something terribly wrong for a heat yeah. pump company to go out of business at this point. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, I suppose the contractor could go out of business, but... Yeah. yeah. It, it should be fine. So, uh, well, we'll talk more about that as we go along, because heat pumps are the new thing, even even where we live, apparently. We're mm -hmm. certainly going to monitor if you freeze into a popsicle or not uh, after you get your <laughs> heat pump. Because yeah. uh, we get down to minus 40 here uh, yeah. as we talk it's, about our electric vehicles. It's much more of a no-brainer if you're on the West Coast or on the East Coast of Canada. Or you pretty know, much anywhere a, in the world where people live. Pretty much anywhere <laughs> in the world. It's just our ridiculous uh, climate. And just coincidentally, you know, we have fairly decent natural gas prices. By the way, we're still looking for a clean energy show property in Hawaii, if you have any. Yeah, please. Anyway, Brian, uh, I want to say thank you to our donors because uh, we've had big donations to the show, not just donations, which are humbling enough, but big ones. And thank you to the people who have done that. One person chose to do a email transfer, you know, an e-transfer rather, b via yeah. email and uh, because they didn't want to lose any fees and make the most of their donations that did that and it worked out nicely. So thank you to everyone. I won't name you because you didn't say you could be named, but you know, you know who you are. We appreciate you greatly, and uh, thank you. I, I might yeah. be getting a new toaster for Christmas, Brian, oh, by the fantastic. way. Fantastic. It's it's a Christmas miracle in the Whittingham house. Yes. You have a very <laughs> expensive toaster, which I envy, because it's motorized, right? Yes. Is it still I've working forgotten. out okay for you? Yeah, no, it's it's worked flawlessly. Is it a Breville? I think it's a Breville, but yeah. it's, it's, it's a very nice toaster, highly recommended. And... I'd love to have that, but I'm not going to. So unless I, yeah, I'm in your will and you specifically willed me the toaster and you can go ahead and do that if you like, mm -hmm. but um, I'm not sure that I'm going to ever afford one because the motorized ones are all pretty expensive and I just can't justify it. Yeah. But again, you know, thank you very much for your donations. This is an independent production. We've been doing it for over two years now and, you know, we do it because we love the show and we love the planet. Um, but it's also uh, nice to get some money in so James can get a new toaster. We have, um, um, or I guess we're approaching our third year pretty quick. Before you know it, it'll be three that's years. True. My goodness. That's right. We're coming up on three. Yep. Say, did you happen to see Saturday Night Live, the comedy, uh, live comedy show in North America here? Did you happen to see it? Uh, I saw part of it with Steve Martin and Martin. Yeah, Schwartz. Steve Martin. I saw part of it. A couple of my favorite. Which parts did you see? Mm, the beginning and the end? I can't remember. Okay, you saw the beginning. So you would have seen, they were doing, in the opening monologue, which I thought was quite well done, they were doing each other's eulogies. They had oh, yeah, right. that was pretended funny, yeah. to have written each other's <laughs> eulogies. And this is uh, Steve Martin um, reading from his eulogy that he had prepared pre-death for Martin Short, his friend. But I'll always be haunted by Marty's last words, Tesla autopilot, engage! <laughs> I thought that was funny, so I played yes. it on the show. <laughs> <laughs> My son, he's been nagging me just before showtime today on uh, this big fusion announcement. And he, he didn't. Yeah. I was waiting to hear from him on this because he's one of these people, these silver bullet people, which is almost mm -hmm. everyone. It's probably 99% of the people <laughs> who listen to our show. I'm sorry, but there, everybody has this silver bullet where it's a, a pet of theirs, an energy pet. Yeah. Whether yeah. it's nuclear as a whole, some people are yeah. do that. There's and then there's nuclear fusion, which has been talked about. I mean, I learned about nuclear fusion from my hairdresser uh, <laughs> twenty five years ago. He's like, "Oh, it's coming! It's coming quick!" <laughs> and you know that's going to be the thing. We don't, you know, that's going to solve this whole problem. 
Yeah. And of course, a lot of people believe that, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's it's been frustratingly long to get to the achievement that was that we're going to talk about shortly uh, after we update some other stories. But he says this, my first text from my son after the announcement is, oh, God, you're going to hate this. So he, he's right away, he's assuming that I'm going to be upset by this because I know I've been telling him, arguing with him about nuclear that, yeah. you know, it, it can't compete on cost. And he says the first fusion reactor has been built that produces more energy than it consumes. And later on, after a bunch of bickering and uh, quotes and uh, articles sent back and forth, he said, you said solar would be so cheap that it would be even cheaper than fusion, even down the line. And I was actually quite excited about this announcement on a personal level. I was, you know, yeah. uh, I spent, you know, the better part of a week researching and, and uh, yeah. digging into this uh, so that I could talk about it on the show this week and uh, have mm -hmm. my facts straight. Well, it turns out I was right. I mean, you know, not to spoil the story, but <laughs> I, I'm afraid I was right that it is going to be very expensive. Uh, I mean, we're not... I'll get to it later, okay? Yeah. But it's it's not going to happen quickly, and it's not going to happen cheaply. And the people who made the announcement are the people saying that. So it's not, mm -hmm. you know, me poo-pooing nuclear. I am, however, quite excited on a personal level that my kids' generation and my grandkids' generation will have power uh, that won't have to deal with nuclear waste. It'll be completely yeah. safe and completely, uh, you know... I mean, it's it's a wonderful technology that is uh, has very few caveats of any. I mean, it's just aside from expense and not being developed yet into a power plant. But yeah, we'll talk about that later. Those substations, I keep seeing them in the news when I'm flipping through the channels. Yeah, uh, it's turning into a big story. This the the shooting of the substations. Yeah, so we talked about this probably last week, where in North Carolina, there was a shooting attack on an electrical substation, and, you know, 30, 40,000 people were without power for uh, almost a week. And uh, then a few days after that, news of gunfire near the Duke Energy Facility in South Carolina. Now, it seems like probably nothing happened with that one. There were some shots heard, and... Um, not no no power outages, uh, but there's a great article on NPR about this. Uh, North Carolina attacks highlight the vulnerability of power grids, and uh, so here's the thing: there's 55,000 electrical substations around the U.S., and most of them are kind of vulnerable. Um, these things are liquid cooled. This is the main kind of danger: they're liquid cooled, so you can take a rifle shoot into them and then all the liquid drains out and then they overheat and then they fail um it's not like you. so shoot probably it. the whole thing fails and i'm guessing it's not just one component yeah one capacitor or one individual component the whole thing has to be replaced yeah. or we shouldn't be telling people this <laughs> but it no, is in the news <laughs> it is it, in the news and some of them have been over the years um sort of fortified like put up like brick walls and stuff is that um, right i didn't know that but, yeah, but, um, you know, there's 55,000 of them and they're not going to be particularly uh, well protected, of course. Um, yeah, I, it's it's a concern. I mean, it, it's maybe be not um, something we should be worried about yet, but uh, I don't know. Who knows? Well, if somebody decided to get organized and, um, you know, attack uh, on a coordinated basis, I mean, a week-long power outage for tens of thousands of people is nothing to sneeze at. And it sounded like it was awfully easy to do with, um, I wonder, you know, if, if they had the knowledge of what they were doing or if it was just, they were shot at it and, and got lucky. And just got or, lucky. I'm not sure. I mean, it, presumably they knew, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's this issue of the, the cooling liquid, uh, leaking out. So, uh, um, well, let's hope it was a disgruntled power employee and not somebody who knows what they're doing and trying to disrupt the United States because that could be, you know, I've seen, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, I've seen uh, people talking about on television, experts saying that you can't really protect the power. They're not, it's just not going to happen. You have to find yeah. the people doing it and then get to it that way. I mean, you could put up more barriers and some of them do have, you know, like brick walls around them or whatever, but it's, you know, it seems unlikely. I mean, if it turns into a bigger problem, then perhaps there'll be a mass deployment of walls, but uh, not at the moment. And one of the problems that I keep seeing mentioned is that a lot of these stations, they want to be away from people. People don't want to look at them. 
Yeah. And so they're kind of isolated. In fact, some of them are extremely isolated. They're very remote in rural areas, not near population. So. Yeah. So uh, ground mount solar, I know that you brought this up on the show uh, several months ago. This is the idea of putting solar panels just uh, completely flat on the ground. Without which, any hardware or panels really yeah, at all. They're just uh, connected together somehow. So you level the make, ground first. You probably have to level it, make a nice smooth level chunk yeah. of land. And you probably have gravel. to make a sort of like drainage ditches and, and stuff like that. Yeah. But um, so we have one now that's coming online in Texas. And this is uh, 100 megawatts. This is a decent sized uh, solar project. That's so this 10 times coming, what we have here where we live. They're making 10 megawatt live. ones here. And it's just a normal one on regular mounts. This is 100 megawatts. This story is from Electrek. And it will be the only utility scale solar farm that is mounted flat so far to date. Um, and, you know, there's many advantages to this, but one of them is just that you can put more panels in the same kind of area. That's you're right. Basically yeah. just sticking them up right next to each other. So if you're in an area where land is an issue and you don't quite have enough land for this stuff. Um, now, of course, there's downsides to that too. Like, you know, you got, you don't get the advantage of the, the angle of the sun, but as we talk about frequently on the show, the whole solar system will eventually be so overbuilt that, um, you know, those kinds of issues uh, aren't that big a deal. But uh, one of the biggest benefits of this, as near as I can tell, is, you know, they can just uh, basically they throw a Roomba on this thing <laughs> to yeah. keep it clean. Uh, but that's you know, also got... one of the challenges, Brian, is the, the fact that they get dirtier because they yes, just sit they... there. There's not as that's much right. of runoff. But then, yeah, the, at the same time, the solution to that problem works quite well, you say. It's a dirt cheap. It's like um, it can the robot can clean up to two megawatts of the solar uh, every day. So they just, you know, the robot can just kind of run continuously like a Roomba runs, you know, in people's houses. So every uh, 50 sort of days, like, it starts over. <laughs> and, yeah. So yeah. The, the rough cost to clean a tracker plant one time is 50 cents per kilowatt hour. This is a plant where they're mounted normally. Um, 50 cents per kilowatt out for per kilowatt. And these panels can be cleaned um, for a year at 50 cents per kilowatt. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That is a, that's very interesting. So you would save money, you know, hardware is not cheap, but the solar panels that, that, that I saw here they track. They're on. They're yeah. on movable tracking things that track the sun east mm -hmm. to west. Uh, yeah. So that's very interesting. And of course, Texas is a lot farther south. We're in. Yeah. You know, that's Canada, that's going to make a difference. Yeah, we're not in the far north of Canada. We're in southern Canada, but that's still quite far north. So, you know, if we had flat panels here, the winter production would be pretty abysmal. Yeah, I don't and, think it uh, makes sense. I said it last time. No. I don't think it makes sense in winter climates, although I'm sure they could develop robots for cleaning snow if yeah. they had to. But yeah. I think it also just works better where we are. And the more northern you are, even northern half of the United States, yeah. uh, it's going to make more sense to actually tilt them towards the sun uh, yeah. perhaps, uh, I, I just, I assume economically it makes more sense. No. And yeah, I, obviously Texas is a lot further South. So the angle of the sun is not as big a deal in the winter. Um, so yeah, there you go. Okay. Uh, so, uh, news, uh, from here in Canada again. So, uh, Canada had made a pledge some time ago to stop subsidizing, uh, fossil fuel projects abroad outside of Canada. Um, so the good news is that Canada has decided to stop any subsidies that would go to fossil fuel projects um, outside of Canada. The bad news is they haven't canceled those projects uh, here at home yet. They haven't canceled those subsidies uh, in Canada. But, uh, you know, what can I say? It's, it's progress of a kind. This was a pledge that Canada had made last year. And there was a deadline at the end of this year. They said, okay, we're going to do it by the end of 2022. So at the last minute, they have pulled it out and made that announcement. But, you know, this is typical of the, the progress that's happening right now in, in clean energy is that, you know, governments are just not moving fast enough. Uh, but, uh, yeah, at least they're moving. Yeah. 
And I wish they'd done it with Inside the Borders. I mean, we're at a pretty critical time here, climate-wise. Yeah. It'd be nice if they, uh, you know, got on that. Yeah. You know, Canada is a fossil fuel country. It is a big part of our economy. So, of course, they're worried about killing the economy, and that's why they haven't done it here at home. Um, but, you know, it's coming someday, I guess. All right. It's time for another edition of What Do You Think? <laughs> What do you think? This is where I ask Brian questions that I wonder what he thinks because I don't have an opinion on them. What if I don't care? You do. You always <laughs> care. It's one thing you're known for. Uh, Tesla is going to take part in Canada's budget consultations for the first time. The federal government, they're consulting with budgets. That's interesting to me, I think, but I don't know if it means anything. What do you think? It probably doesn't mean a lot, but certainly Tesla are the experts in fast charging infrastructure for cars. So I think we should probably be grateful that they're putting some uh, input into what's happening here in Canada. Sounds like they're interested in either minerals, mining, or actual manufacturing of batteries, possibly at a plant here in Quebec mm -hmm. with clean, green uh, energy. You know, I saw... I was reading something today. A lot of things make me mad, Brian. I was reading something that's from a scientist. No, it was on TV. It was a scientist on TV. A bonafide scientist has said, the problem with electric cars is you charge them with coal. And people are still saying that. I think yeah. the people of Quebec would take umbrage to that because they're like 95% hydro power yeah. in Quebec. There's lots yeah. of places that we're in one of the places that has the most coal, but not everyone. And of course... That's changing. I've got solar panels yeah. on my roof. You've got solar panels on your roof. That's an option for people. It's not everybody, but it's an option. And it, Yeah, it's changing. And I want to point out that because electric cars are so much more efficient, um, it's probably still cleaner. So what our grid here is 30, 40% coal, something like that. I know. That's what, it, that's so frustrating. You know, it, the, it's ridiculous. this is such a complex issue. If they don't listen to our show, they don't know what's going on. <laughs> like that's it, a problem. It's the year 2022. Like, regardless of climate change, we are burning coal for electricity. It's just absurd. Like, it this is. is just nuts that anybody it does is. that. But the, the point being that, yes, so my electric car is charged 30, 40% coal, though I do have solar panels on my roof, which offsets, um, you know, three quarters of my electrical bill. So I'm three quarters clean because of my solar panels. I do charge a little bit from the grid with the coal, um, but because electric cars are so much more efficient, uh, it is still cleaner. It is still cleaner to drive an electric car on coal. Maybe not 100% coal, but you know, I think 30, 40% coal, the electric car is still a tad cleaner. Yeah, and I, I've seen studies that look at places where it's like 80% coal and it's still cleaner. And it's still cleaner. Or, or it has to be 80% coal in order to, to cross to that threshold. Yeah, so, to cross the threshold. Uh, yeah. Another thing, Brian, is Measurement Canada, that is the government agency in charge of measurements, which you passed a building by during one of your morning walks during the pandemic that said Measurement Canada on the side, and you thought, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, no, in the early days of the pandemic, I was walking around all these weird neighborhoods, and, and I went through this like kind mine. of industrial neighborhood, and uh, I found one of the offices for Measurement Canada, which was this weird entity at the time I'd never heard of, and they had this wonderful slogan on the building called, A Fair Measure for All. And uh, I <laughs> took a photo and posted it on my Instagram, and uh, everyone was thrilled with that. But yeah, Measurement Canada is an organization that deals with measurement. Well, I feel like I've seen Measurement Canada stickers on gas pumps to say this gas pump has been yeah. calibrated at 15 degrees Celsius or something yeah. like that. Yeah. You know, this is to give you the right amount of juice for your money, basically. Yeah, th this is typically what Measurement Canada has been involved with is regulations around measuring things like fuels to make sure that consumers aren't getting ripped off. But now in the age of electric cars, they are involved in the fast charging industry. Well, uh, the headline is that they're now accepting applications from charging providers for per kilowatt hour billing. So I guess it wasn't allowed because th they needed to regulate that to make sure that people were getting properly billed, that they were yeah. getting a kilowatt hour worth of electricity. Yeah. Do you think this is uh, a preferable way to go? Oh, yeah. This is definitely a, a huge step 
forward. This is something that the Tesla started lobbying for a couple of years ago. So uh, yeah, when you charge in, and it's not just in Canada, other places have these kind of regulations too, where electricity can only be sold by the electricity utility. That's basically what the law is. You've got to be an electrical utility to sell electricity. So what they have to do instead in Canada and some other places is you just charge by the minute instead. So you charge into the Tesla fast charger and you don't get charged by the actual amount of electricity that goes into your battery. You get charged by time. Now they try and make it so it's a similar amount. Like they, you know, uh, there's different tiers. So if your car is charging like above 60 kilowatts, there's a certain rate that's kind of higher and then below 60 kilowatts and then below 40 kilowatts, it gets uh, cheaper. So, you know, they're trying to give you a similar experience, but, um, it's not fair because, you know, your car sometimes, especially in the cold, just charges slower. And, um, you know, if you, that very end of the charging process, it really slows down. So like, if you have to charge your car up to a hundred percent, that last 2% takes a really long time. So you, even though it's at the lower rate, you end up paying a fortune. Well, it's not a fortune. It's still a $20 fill up but you end up paying a lot for that last 2% of the battery, but you know, you might really need it in the cold weather. All right. It's time for full team coverage of the fusion breakthrough. Uh, New York so, times says, let me just get this ahead. straight. So by full team, you mean you mm -hmm. and, and you. Okay. Both of them. Well, yeah, that's <laughs> okay. about it. I mean, there's a cat that sometimes works on the show, but not this week. Uh, okay. Scientists achieve nuclear fusion breakthrough with blast of 192 lasers. The advancement by Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory researchers will be built um, on. Okay. The advancement by Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory researchers will be built on to further develop fusion energy research. So this is a laboratory milestone, one that has been sought after for decades, Brian. And from an environmental perspective, fusion has always had a strong appeal because it's uh, it's not dangerous. It's, uh, it's different than fission, which is your normal nuclear power. Fusion uh, combines atoms rather than splits them, right? It puts them together. Uh, you can <laughs> watch YouTube videos like I did to get a, a brush up on what fusion is. Uh, but it's very interesting, and it's just hard to do, and they haven't achieved a net energy gain. So it takes a lot of energy to create um, particles, atoms, that want to fuse together. It, it's hotter than the inside air of the sun, the sun air of the sun. Yeah, well, I watched a YouTube channel, uh, the Cleo Abram YouTube channel, Huge If True is sort of the name of the series, and a couple of YouTubers, did you watch that? A couple of YouTubers built a, a fusion reactor in a garage. <laughs> Did they? Yeah. Okay. And it it worked, but the key is they did not get more energy out than they put in. So, And this has been the, the problem with fusion for all these years. It takes a huge amount of energy, and they're not getting even that amount of energy yeah, out of it until now. Billions of dollars from governments around the world have been put into this, and this is the first time that it's happened. I guess they got out 1.5 times the energy that they put in using the world's most powerful laser to do this. Uh, there's always a nagging caveat, however, with this and in, in that all of its efforts by scientists to control the unruly power of fusion, their experiments consume more energy than what was going in. But that changed, Brian, according to the New York Times, at 1.03 a.m. on December 5th when 192 giant lasers at the laboratory's national ignition facility blasted a small cylinder about the size of a pencil eraser that contained a frozen nubin of hydrogen. Do you have any frozen nubins of hydrogen laying around the house? Probably not. Let me check the freezer. It, oh, encased in diamonds, so that makes it even more rare. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds totally practical. Totally practical. Well, that's, that's what they did, and that's kind of, yeah, it's a long story, but the, that's what they did. They used all these lasers to get to that, and in a brief moment, lasting less than 100 trillionths of a second, 205, no, pardon me, 2.05 megajoules of energy, roughly the equivalent of a pound of TNT, nothing to sneeze at, bombarded the hydrogen pellet out of flowed from that pellet, a flood of neutron particles, the product of fusion. 
See, when you put things, when you put particles together, they create energy. When you take them apart, they create energy, uh, which carried about three megajoules of energy, a factor of 1.5. Yeah, and this is basically, this is how the sun works. The sun is like fusion energy is as near as I understand it. That's correct. And, and obviously the sun is producing endless amounts of uh, energy for free. It's doing a hell of a job. So the solar panels on our roof are technically fusion. <laughs> yeah. Technically. Wind is technically solar uh, because you need uh, the sun to create wind because it's the energy differences that create wind. So some people okay. like to call wind power solar power. And uh, now we can call it fusion. I don't know if you want to. So does Tuesday's announcement mean we'll have cheap fusion energy soon? A lot of people, such as my um, uppity son, would say yes. They assume, oh, it's a breakthrough. They'll start manufacturing tomorrow. A couple of years from now, we'll see uh, solar panels go into the landfill. Yeah. Well, it's taken them, what, 50 years to get <laughs> yeah. this far? Well, the answer is no, according to the New York Times, okay? So even if scientists figure out how to generate bigger bursts of fusion, immense engineering hurdles would remain. Uh, experiments have studied one burst at a time, basically. So a practical fusion power plant using this concept would require a machine gun pace of laser bursts with new hydrogen targets sliding into place for each burst. That's the challenge. They're using magnets and, and magnetism to float things and have a continuous repeating chain. There's three different ways of uh, or, or approaches to uh, fusion power. And this is basically an experiment at a nuclear weapons facility. But there's a Canadian um, team working on something too, and they're going to have a prototype uh, power plant um, getting built in the UK. But it still doesn't mean that it's anywhere near decades away. So the torrents of neutrons flying outward from the fusion reactions would have to be converted into electricity. That's another challenge. Basically, the fact that they created more energy doesn't make a power plant, okay? So the no. laser complex uh, fills a building with a footprint equal to three football fields. So it's too big, too expensive, and too inefficient for a commercial power plant, at least right now. A manufacturing process to mass produce the, the precise hydrogen targets would have to be developed. And that sounds to me nowhere near okay let's put it in the context brian because remember we have to decarbonize the planet by 50 percent by 2030 and 100 percent by 2050 and china yeah. if you're listening 2060 is not good enough uh and we can do it in fact we have 80 percent of the technology available to to 100 by 2030 i've read yeah if we wanted to um yeah but we, we choose well, not the to problem is it's just, you know, things like uh, heat pumps, you know, like there's going to be a waiting list for my heat pump. We need to just, you know, crank up production of the existing technologies, wind, solar batteries and heat pumps. Um, we just got to make enough of them and that's all we need. We're, you know, my son doesn't think that the world is coming together and will reach those targets. I hope they do. I think they'll miss them. But uh, at the same time, I think people underestimate the economics of clean energy in yeah. from 2030 to 2050 like it's going to just you know mm -hmm. erase at least as far as power generation goes this is from power magazine they're on top of this too uh, tony relstone a nuclear engineer at cambridge university in the uk told uh, national public radio in the united states that unless more significant progress is made fusion would be unlikely to have a major role in power generation for another 40 to 50 years yeah that's too late it's too late it's um too late for me too <laughs> <laughs> uh, my kids might see it at the, when they're my age or older. Uh, my grandkids might live in a world where uh, you uh, a solar farm erected today would come down and mm -hmm. be decommissioned in thirty years, and even then, it's not it doesn't sound like it's it, it's going to be there. Okay, it could be, but it doesn't sound like it would be. Well, there's, this is something we've talked about before, too, but there's so many super complicated energy systems that exist today, including things like nuclear. Like, making a nuclear plant is just insanely complicated. Building an offshore floating oil platform to drill for oil, like, it's insanely complicated. And if solar, wind, and batteries has existed, existed 50 years ago, we wouldn't have done any of these things. <laughs> like, they're just too complicated and expensive when these cheaper alternatives exist. 
And that's kind of the problem is that solar and wind and batteries and, and geothermal and other things that exist and are getting cheaper uh, make it less profitable for, you know, these for investment yeah, in, in the stuff like this, because yeah. there's going to be huge upfront costs to get the development there. And then you're going to have to really back the technology in order to get the prices down. So David Keith, mm -hmm. uh, climate expert, uh, says fusion maybe, but beware of the hype. Um, I don't know the details, he says, but for what it's worth, my f my first professional job was in Canada's national lab working big lasers for fusion, and I have been interested since. Uh, getting more energy out than went in into the laser is cool technical benchmark, but it has almost nothing to do with the practical requirements to make commercial power. That's what people don't realize. and. Yeah, you you hear this this uh, this this silver bullet thing. I'm going to finish what he had to say, but they're just not looking at the whole picture, and maybe they're not hearing that one sentence, that caveat at the end of the interview, which is really important. Suppose one had a free supply of fusion reactions in pellets, you could make competitive electricity. He asks, hard, getting cheap energy from uh, neutrons is really hard even those neutrons if they're free it's really hard and worse when it needs a high vacuum so there's lots of just technical details that that are yeah. hurdles really yeah well this these youtubers that made a uh, a fusion reactor in their garage um yeah like a vacuum is one of the big things for it you got to suck all the air out and they you know blew a breaker on their wall and then they lost all the air and then they had to suck all the air out again uh, it's still kind of cool that they made it and they sort of made it with these off the shelf parts. Um, it, you know, it's a lot of fun, but, uh, yeah, it's just insanely complicated. It's, it, it is a, a genuine breakthrough. Like they got more energy out and people have been trying to do this for literally 50 years or more. So it's a huge breakthrough, but nowhere near practical. But it's a slow churn towards commercialization, which is what we think of, right? So, um... You know, another challenge is that it is as hot as the sun. So you have, you know, that stuff breaks <laughs> down when you have something that mm -hmm. has to contain something that hot and a vacuum in particular. So there's there's serious challenges here that I'm confident they'll work out. And I think that, you know, uh, next century, there will be no wind turbines or maybe even solar panels that will just have fusion at the end of the century sometime. Maybe 60 years from now when it's cheap and t cheap enough to spread, 70 years, I don't know. Um, I think it is the future. It's just going to take a long, it sounds like it's going to take a long road to get there. So uh, Bloomberg says this, they have a uh, opinion columnist that says, well, okay, what challenges remain? It's, a st it's still a long way from the breakthrough in California to building a fusion-based power plant. It's still a long way from the breakthrough in California to build to building a fusion-based power plant. Well, this experiment generated excess uh, energy on a small scale. The industry needs to develop systems that can produce much more excess energy on a much larger scale. Uh, this is 1.5, Brian. I heard 10x as kind of where they need to be. A net energy gain shows that the concept will work, but the systems are still complicated and expensive. This test used some of the most powerful lasers ever built, and they aren't readily available for commercial power plants. The industry still needs to do a lot of work to make the technology widely available and affordable. And uh, that was just from Bloomberg. Okay, this is the opinion piece from Bloomberg from David Fickling. You can have the uh, energy gain by... 50% because uh, you lose most of your heat or half your heat in the system, such as the cooling, you know, the just the, the water and the pipes and everything get, get lost. So the New York Times uh, says this. This is uh, just taught off the press. This is after the announcement, which happened a little while ago on uh, Tuesday morning. It says it will take quite a while before fusion becomes available on a widespread practical scale, if ever Probably decades, said Kimberly S. Boodle, the director of the Lawrence Livermore uh, facility where this announcement took place. The director herself is saying probably decades. So I'm not being a poo-poo here. I, uh, I'm not being a, <laughs> a nuclear naysayer. Uh, this is from the horse's mouth, literally. Now, other people in the industry will say, well, we've moved along fast and it's going to be better than that. But, you know, it's certainly going to be decades. 
You know, we, we might have something functioning next decade in some level, but it's not yeah. going to be commercially functioning uh, that you can replicate and spread. Okay. This is what she said at the news conference. So not six decades, say, not six decades, I don't think, which is what most people used to say. Uh, I think not even five decades, which is what we used to say most often. Uh, so that sounds like 40 years. I think it's good moving into the foreground and probably with concerted effort and investment, a few, could, a few decades of research on the underlying technologies could put us in a position to build a power plant. Yeah, this is not around the corner. I'm sorry. I mean, I wish it was, but it's not. Most mm -hmm. cli climate scientists and policymakers say that to achieve that goal of limiting warming to 2 degrees Celsius or even the more ambitious target of 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming by 2050, the world must reach net zero emissions by then. And this, Brian, under any circumstance, doesn't seem like it's going to be any significant part of that, even under the most ambitious, optimistic scenario. Um we still have to rely on what we have and what we have will become, you know, at least half as expensive, uh, in the next decade. So yeah, Catherine Hale, this is, uh, the Canadian climate scientist. Uh, I'll just add this on here. She said on Twitter, yes, it's a huge technological advance and yes, it will help us long-term, but no, it won't get us out of the climate crisis we're in today. The biggest invention we need right now, political and corporate will. We need Canada to stop those fossil fuel subsidies, uh, not just abroad, but here at home as well. Uh, all right, well, I think this next story is the perfect one to go into because it's the exact opposite of what we're just talking about, the exact opposite of the incredibly complex world of fusion reactors. So this is a story from Clean Technica. Wind power to cut cargo ship emissions by... 20%. So basically what they're talking about doing, cargo ships take an enormous amount of fuel to, um, you know, ship stuff around the world. Uh, you know, they're going to put wind sails on them. And, uh, you know, like you ever see uh, like kiteboarding, is that what that's called? Yeah. Or, or uh, parasailing, where you can get on skis in the water and you've got a big sail in front of you to pull you along. On Saw that you're from your cottage. There are some parasailers at our cottage. It's a crazy sport. And, uh, I wish I could gonna... do it, but yeah. you know, I'm too old. It's passed me by. Anyway, they're going to do this on cargo ships. So this is the sea wing sail from a French company called Air Seas. Wait a minute. It's, it's going to be and like a parachute. It's like a par it's like a parachute. Like it's not like a sailing ship where you're you're putting up a sail. Oh, because I've it seen pictures of hard sails put on ships, both new ships yeah. and retrofitting ships. And, but this and there's different sort this of is crazy. rotating Yeah, there's different rotating turbines that they figured out for ships that kind of sit that look like a chimney. Um, oh, I'm that, looking at a picture right now. But yeah, this is a it's like a parachute. And now I assume the caveat is you've got to have the wind at your back for this to work. Yeah, what happens if the, um, the kite goes down? It looks like it, the ship is flying a giant kite. Yeah, the ship is flying a giant kite. Um, but, you know, I imagine there's prevailing westerly winds out on the ocean. So, you know, if you're if you're sailing west, just throw up your sail. And has this been tested? Use it on the way back. Uh, yes, this has been tested. It should cut emissions by 20%. Like, this is a thing, you know, wind power works. I'm kind of speechless. Like, this seems really kooky, <laughs> to be honest yeah. with you. I mean, uh, when you go and fly a kite, the kite twirls around and goes down into the ground, and you have to send yeah. your kid to go throw it up in the air again, and then, you know, you know how that works. Well, yeah. you couldn't do that with this. It'd be go hit the water, and then you'd be like, oh, well, I guess we're done. I mean, I'm, uh, you know, I'm sure there's ways to, you know, people figure this out for parasailing, for, for kite surfing. Uh, why can't they figure it out for ships? Well, they've got a dude who's very skilled pulling that, that, uh, that parasail at the right time to get it lifted up again. Yeah. And, you know, you become very adept at that. But unless there's an automated AI system or something doing it. I don't know. But I mean, this is not the ocean. The ocean is a steady, you're not looking at gusts on the ocean. It's a, yeah, I don't, I'm not mm. an atmospheric expert for oceans, but you're I not? assume, I assume 
that it's a, a regular, it's less gusty, that it's just a, a blow. Yeah. It, it flows uh, regularly. Yeah, and they're not talking about powering the whole ship this way. It's a 20% reduction in emissions. It's, this should help. So that's 20% reduction in the price that it takes to fuel those goods across the ocean too, so. Yeah, fuel is uh, super expensive and you would save 20% of your costs. Yeah, well, that's interesting. And maybe it would work with uh, onboard sales as well, the ones that I was talking about. Brian, I wanted to talk to you about the Salton Sea. This is a place that I passed by in my big California trip a number of years ago. Uh, we went down to Calexico, which is right on the U.S. border. There's a little town on the uh, American side called Calexico. On the other side, looks very different. It's called Mexicali, and it's kind of a cute thing. And, of course, there's lots of drugs going on there, according to uh, the shows I've watched on TV. Anyway, you get you, – it's, it's 40 miles north of the border. There's the Salton Sea, which is uh, this dead – Salty lake bed, okay? It's always been that way. And I guess in 1905, there was this overflowing of the Colorado River. It overflowed uh, some canals and filled it up partially. I guess it's, it used to be much bigger years and years, well, decades, hundred, perhaps centuries ago. I don't know. But it filled up a little bit back then. And then it became like this popular resort in the 50s for like Frank uh, Sinatra. And celebrities would all just go over there from LA and live in the salt water. And there's all these remnants of this 1950s vacation-y place left to look at when you go. It's a ghost town now. But yeah. there's lots of geothermal in the area, okay? And what I didn't know, what I just learned today, is that it's got a lot of bad dust. So uh, because it's geothermal, because the crust is between two tectonic plates, it's thin there. And so the water just sort of gurgles up the brine from the, the groundwater and it gurgles up because it's heated. And then it brings with it minerals, including uh, lithium. And then the water dries and it just leaves the lithium behind. So this could be the cleanest, greenest lithium on the planet, they claim. And not only that, there's a lot of it. There could be enough to power the entire United States' uh, lithium needs and then some. Yeah, of course, lithium being one of the key components in uh, lithium-ion batteries, which are kind of uh, running the world right now. So, yeah, then there's lots of dust, including arsenic dust, which is kicking up. So people try not to even live there anymore. But there was this, like, this huge artist community. I mean, you're getting close to Coachella uh, and places like that uh, down there. So 11 geothermal plants producing 400 megawatts, which powers 350,000 homes worth just from geothermal. So there's actually a lot of geothermal plants there, probably the most in North America, I'd guess. The Earth's uh, crust, like I said, is thin, so all this stuff gurgles up. And Now, usually at a geothermal plant, they would put the brine back into the ground. They would, the water would come up, this hot brine, yeah. but they take the energy out of it and transfer it to water to produce steam and then put it back in the ground. But what they're saying is it could be a cheap way to, since they're bringing it up already, to just turn that into uh, a lithium extraction right there at the geothermal plant. So one of these, or all of the 11 geothermal plants. Uh, yeah. Lithium mining is usually water intensive and leaves behind contaminants. And this bypasses those things. And there's a cool 15 minute video that CNBC did. I'll put a link in your show notes for you to have a look at that. Just wanted to pass that along. Yeah, that sounds uh, exciting. Um, and just some quick bad news, the bad news story of the week, uh, the Keystone Pipeline. So this is one of the major oil pipelines that runs between Canada and the U.S. Uh, massive leak in Kansas. 26,000 barrels of oil have now leaked from the Keystone Pipeline uh, since 2010. So this is the company TC Energy. Big controversy in Canada lately about expanding the Keystone Pipeline. Um, with kind of mixed results, but I think it's just important to remember that um, pipelines, it's probably a safer way to transport than by rail. There was a, a, a derailment near us not long ago uh, with some uh, oil on board, that uh, massive fire, but 26,000 uh, barrels of oil since 2010 coming out of that pipeline. Um, we'll be better off once we can stop doing that. Yeah, boy, a world without pipeline leaks or oil spills, wouldn't that be something um, 
Yeah. All right, a nuclear study um, as a solution to global warming. This is something I want to talk about because it's from Stanford. They did a study. And basically, they said that in evaluating the solutions to global warming and air pollution and energy security, two important questions arise, and they are, should new nuclear plants be built to help solve these problems? A lot of people say yes, without thinking about it. I say, uh, should existing aged nuclear plants be kept open as long as possible to help solve these problems? To answer these questions, the main risks associated with nuclear power are examined. And the risks associated with nuclear power can be broken down into two categories. One, risk risks affecting its ability to reduce global warming and air pollution. Two, risks affecting its ability to provide energy and environmental uh, security aside from climate and air pollution. So the risks in the former category include delays between planning and operation, emissions contributing to global warming and outdoor air pollution, and costs, as we talk about a lot. Risks in the latter category include weapons proliferation risks, reactor meltdown risk, radioactive waste risk, and mining cancer and land uh, despoilment risks. So new nuclear power plants cost 2.3 to 7.4 times those of onshore wind or utility PV per kilowatt hour. And they take five to seven years longer between planning and operation, five to 17 years longer, and produce nine to 37 times the emissions per kilowatt as wind. Something you don't hear about, hmm. you know, the, the yeah. emissions that nuclear actually produces is not zero. And it's actually hmm. nine to 37 times the emissions uh, of its energy output compared to wind. So as such, a fixed amount of money spent on a new nuclear plant means much less power generation, a much longer wait for power, and a much greater emission rate than the same money spent on WWS technology, wind, water, and solar. There is no such thing as a zero or close to zero emission nuclear power plant, says the study. Even existing plants emit due to the continuous mining and refining of uranium needed for the plant. And however, though, all power plants emit 4.4 grams per CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour from the water vapor and heat they release. So water vapor is bad. And this is a question I have about the fission, the fusion plants rather, is that are they emitting any water vapor? I, I, I haven't heard on that, and I will get back to you as soon as I hear something. Or if you know something, always email us at the Clean Energy Show, uh, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. This contrasts with solar panels and wind turbines, which uh, reduce heat or water vapor fluxes to the air. Uh, on top of that, because of all nuclear reactors, they take 10 to 19 years or more between planning and operation. It is two to five years for utility solar or wind. And nuclear causes, uh, you know, a lot of emissions for 100 years. Overall, emissions from the new nuclear are 78 to 178 grams per CO2 per kilowatt hour, and not close to zero at all. So China's investment in nuclear plants takes so long between planning and operation instead of wind and solar resulted, you know, because it chose nuclear instead of wind and solar, but it took so long, China's CO2 emissions were increased 1.3% from 2016 to 2017 in one year, um, rather than they should have declined by 3% if they went the way that we suggest here on the show, Brian. Yeah, solar, wind, and batteries. The resulting difference in air pollution emissions may have caused 82,000 additional air pollution deaths in China. This is nothing to sneeze at, literally. Yeah. Uh, between in 2016 alone with additional deaths in years prior and since. Um, I'm going to skip the lift story because we're out of time. I'm going to get to the brightest time for the tweet of the week. Okay, this is from Michael Mann, Michael E. Mann, A, at Michael E. Mann, two ends on the man. This is, uh, you know, the climate guy that's always on TV. Well, one of the most respected and known climate scientists in the world. Uh, Professor Michael E. Mann says on Twitter, before people get too excited about nuclear fusion announcement, um, having more energy out than in, 
Uh, this announcement was anticipated a long time ago that we would get here, so it's not terribly surprising. Uh, economic viability probably requires a quotient of 10 times. I'd be more excited about an announcement that the United States is ending fossil fuel subsidies than anything else. That is uh, kind of what we've been talking about. It is alarming that fossil fuel subsidies still exist anywhere on Earth, but they absolutely do. All right. Um, some feedback here that came in just as we were wrapping up last week's show. This is from, uh, well, let's listen. Hmm. Aloha, James and Brian. My name is Ryan Nielsen. I live in a little town called Galax, Virginia, G-A-L-A-X, like galaxy without the Y. Um, I originally grew up in Hawaii, hence the aloha. Um, go Hawaii for their clean energy. I've heard lots of things about it on uh, your, your show the last few months. I've been listening for about six months now and never miss a week. Um, we started listening after we got our first electric vehicle, an Ionic 5, um, and have taken an increased interest in uh, the environment and helping to save our planet. Um, we just found out yesterday about a solar farm. It's going to be a 20 megawatt solar farm that's in the plans uh, for our community, just a few miles from our home. And they're having a public commentary period for the next few weeks. Um, I will be going to a public meeting for it at our uh, local library tomorrow. And um, I wanted to get your guys' thoughts on um, the the pros of uh, solar farms um, in the community um, to counter all of the negative, as there are lots of outlandish and ridiculous claims um, that are out there and already being put out there. So hope to hear from you guys. i um, been wanting to leave one of these messages for a while. Um, mahalo for all that you do. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you know, we love... Um, speak pipe voicemails because we get to hear our listeners. You're not just a yeah. intangible thing that we have to kind of imagine. Yeah, and people can listen to somebody else for a change. Yeah, no, it's like having a third third host on the show or a guest, perhaps. Um, uh, congratulations on the Anic Five. That's great news. I'm hoping you're enjoying it. If you have any issues with it or any questions or concerns, let us know. Um, you know, this is a 20 meg. I, I know more about Galax, uh, Virginia than I should, Brian, because I, I've been trying to find out, trying to find this, this solar farm proposal and I can't find it. There's lots of other oh, yeah. ones, but I couldn't find it. I went to the Galax, you know, library and I couldn't find it there. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, I, I can't find anything about it. So I don't know what the exact location is. My only guess that a solar farm could be trouble is if it visually disturbs nature. Uh, when they yeah. put it on a hillside or a high elevation, that's the only thing that I can think of. And I have seen something like that, and I would say, well, why don't you put that in a valley or why don't you put that on a, a flat piece of land where you can't really see it? I mean, people mm -hmm. probably don't even notice the solar farms on flat land if you're driving down the highway, if you're not looking for it. Um, that's the only, there's no negatives, Brian. There's, there's yeah. no negatives. No, and wind is kind of the same thing. Like there can be an issue with migratory birds and, and killing birds, but I think usually the people who are against wind turbines don't genuinely care about birds. So, Hell you know, no. there's always small issues. My brother was just telling me recently, he lives in rural Ontario, and this sort of came up at a local planning meeting for the small town that, that he was in, and they weren't planning to do any clean energy, but it was just sort of on the agenda and they wanted to kind of get everybody's opinion, like the, the city councillors, and everybody was against it, he said. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You know, I don't think it would have been a year or two ago. I think the, the rhetoric on Facebook, mm -hmm. which is a lot of small town people are even more connected to Facebook than anyone else because that's their, you know, they need to be connected and mm -hmm. there's not a Starbucks to go to necessarily. I, I do find that here where we live in a fairly rural area and there's a lot of people on Facebook and they are in their bubbles and they are getting ridiculous information. Now, I don't yeah. know what to tell you about people who believe in ridiculous information. There's no magic bullet. Yeah. I mean, you can try and sit down with them and reason with them and sometimes that works, but yeah, I wouldn't do that myself. I'd like, screw that. If you want to be <laughs> dumb, be dumb. Uh, if you want to have crazy ideas, fine, have crazy ideas. It'll be built somewhere else. It'll be built, you know, in another jurisdiction. 
Well, I guess that's the one sort of saving grace of all this, because, yes, absolutely, there are going to be city councils everywhere voting this kind of stuff down. But, you know, it's a it's a tide that can't be stopped. Clean energy is better and cheaper. It will eventually take over everywhere. It's just uh, unfortunate. But I would encourage people to go to their city council meetings or whatever and, and speak on this topic, because, uh, you know, sometimes if you don't, then nobody does. Yeah. I, I just don't like getting into arguments with people who are cuckoo because you can't res you can't reason with somebody who thinks the earth is flat. And I don't like going to meetings. I don't uh, meetings. I'm not no, a big fan suck. of meetings. So, uh, you know, I decided to start a podcast instead. Um, this is our way to contribute. <laughs> yeah. So 20 megawatts, uh, megawatts is twice the size of the solar farm that I looked at nearby and they're building around here right now. They are building bigger ones down the road. Uh, but, you know, Virginia is actually a pretty good place for solar. They have, you know, projects of a lot of projects on the go. Uh, rooftop solar is possible there. Uh, they have um, the utility there has uh, school bus rebates, which I happened to see just before I got his message that, you know, they, they have uh, they're buying a bunch of electric school buses and they quite like them. Excellent. Uh, they, they are more expensive right now, but they, um, you know, immediately the drivers are, are really praising them and liking them a lot. We love to hear from you. Contact us by email at cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. We're on TikTok. We're on YouTube. Go there. Find us if you'd like to look at us uh, and leave us a voicemail like this one, which was fantastic. And we can't thank you enough. Speakpipe.com slash cleanenergyshow. But if you don't want to do that, send us an email. We'll hear from you one way or another. <laughs> And that means it's time for the lightning round, a fast-paced look at the week in clean energy and climate news. Brian, if our show wasn't long enough as it is, it's long. And I apologize, you know? I apologize, I apologize, I apologize. We are a long one this week. Some people, they can't get enough. Other people say, come on, my commute's over. You should be done by now. <laughs> a new clean energy poll from Abacus Research suggests 64% of Canadians realize that clean energy is cheap, affordable energy which is pretty good, I think. Speaking of, you know, naysayers, uh, and there's a lot in Canada, 64% overall, though, realize that it is a cheap form of energy. That is the positive. It's cheap. It's clean. You know, you want to win over people in a small town? Yeah. Cheap. cheap. You save money. You save money. Everybody likes money. Everybody likes saving money. Maybe, maybe people don't realize that. They probably read on Facebook that it's more expensive. I mean, yeah. we Heard somebody say last week for the oil industry propaganda that wind turbines have never worked anywhere in the world. <laughs> <laughs> They've been in operation for decades. Okay, 68% of Canadians believe that clean energy is secure energy. So that's another one. That's There's two big, talking points for you. Yeah. In clean, our current climate, cheap. energy security is a big, big thing. If you can control your own energy supply and get it from the sun, you don't have to deal with foreign dictators. Yes. So, um, you know, Toyota, again, in the news, they are telling their suppliers that, hold on, we're coming up with a new three-year EV plan, uh, especially with uh, what they deliver to Europe. So it sounds like we're going to hear in the new year, T uh, Toyota coming around on the EVs. We'll see. Oh, it's time for a CS Fast Fact, Clean Energy Show Fast Fact from EcoWatch. In Europe, 40 to 60% of fish caught are discarded because they do not meet supermarket quality standards. Nearly 50% is discarded in the United States. So that is all, food waste is a big thing, Ryan. Don't they, you know, can't they turn it into pet food or something? Uh, discarded. It says discarded. <laughs> That's I'd discarded. look into that further. People have further information, you email us. Uh, U.S. gas prices peaked in June at $5 a gallon. That's $1.31 a liter, which is not where we peaked here. We peaked over $2, didn't we? Yeah, for sure. Uh, humbug, I say to that. In a study of um, 20,055 German adults, they found a strong 2000. correlation. 2,000. What did I say? 20,000? 20, yeah. In a study of 2,055 German adults, uh, a study found that a strong correlation between harboring conspiracy mentality and being unlikely to vote for wind turbines near your community. Again, 
This gets back to our feedback from Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, the correlation held, regardless of if the referendum on the building of turbines was proposed by the supporters of the wind farm or its proponents. So in another study of uh, a similar amount of German adults, a conspiracy mentality was found far and away the biggest predictor of voting against a wind farm, much more so than age, gender, education level, sad, or being politically right wing. So if you believe in conspiracies, regardless of your political affiliation, regardless of your education, and it's always sad to see educated people <laughs> believe conspiracies, but it happens. I've seen it. Um, yeah. So Germany ranks third in the world for installed wind power capacity in 2020. Uh, almost a quarter of the country's energy came from wind. And the government has pledged to double that by 2030, designated 2% of Germany's landmass to become wind farms. So that's our time for this week, Brian. And it is more than time. So thanks for listening, everyone. We always appreciate it. Tell your friends, um, you know, spread the word. Write it on bathroom walls in public washrooms. Well, I don't care, you know. Uh, we like to hear from you. As always, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. Check us out on social media where our handle is at cleanenergypod. And by the way, if you're new to the show, remember to subscribe on your podcast app to get new episodes delivered every week. And there is a donate button in your show notes if you care to buy us a cup of coffee. I look forward to seeing you guys next week. See you next week.